<laughs> All right. Um, so hello, everybody, and welcome to our first webinar for the Center for African Smart Public Value Governance. It's the inaugural webinar. And uh, thank you for registering. Thank you to our speakers for agreeing to be part of our first webinar. You're part of our history. So the way it's going to run today, we'll start with a brief background about the center, and then uh, our speakers will proceed to share their views on the topic of public value governance. So Amar, um, if you don't mind uh, sharing a little bit about um, the, the center, that would be great. Can you see my screen, by the way? I forgot to ask. So, um, Amar? Yeah, thanks, Adila. Yeah. So a little bit of history on the, the Center for African Smart Public Value Governance uh, was founded by three academics who have very different backgrounds. Myself, Amar Siam, a senior lecturer in computing, with an interest in enabling and emerging technologies for smart governance solutions. And Adila Kodabax, a senior lecturer in international relations who specializes in the studies of world politics and contributes regularly to discussions on African governance. Both of us are from Middlesex University of Mauritius and we're joined by Imam Dean Fohim, a postdoctoral fellow who focuses his research on examining measures taken by public sector organizations to address the challenges of a constantly changing and complex environment. And he's based at the KPM Center for Public Management at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Now we conceived of this concept for a center back in September 2020, where we dreamt of a, a center that would investigate governance structures within the public sector and see how we could spark discussions on how we can improve the quality and governance and establish new ways of developing public management theories within an African context. This was not, however, the first time we've collaborated. We, in fact, had invited Imam Dean uh, as a research visitor uh, a number of years ago, whilst he was a PhD student in 2019. And himself and Adila, who was also a PhD student at the time, they worked closely together to deliver a series of workshops covering best practices of how to do world-class research, looking at different aspects of uh, research ranging from the startup phase to analysis and methodology. Finally, I'd like to, to thank the speakers for joining us for this first webinar and the participants for joining us today. And I hope you gain some useful insights and you will join us for some interesting discussions later on. I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Amar. And uh, that's uh, uh, now on me to share a little bit of background on CASP. As uh, Amar mentioned, we have been meeting um, regularly since September, and we have been brainstorming. The very fact that we are coming from three different backgrounds, IT for Amar, uh, public uh, management for Imam Din, and for me in studies of world politics, we have been performing since September of last year, meeting regularly, and we have been exploring the topic of governance, uh, the public, of public sector organization, and uh, the idea that when we talk about governance nowadays, it's not just governance. There are different dimensions that we associate with the concept, good governance, bad governance, and so on. And also another uh, increasingly popular concept associated with governance is that of public values. So um, the idea, the way we have interpreted uh, public value is in the sense of creation of what is good for society. And that is central to any society's well-being. The ones responsible for delivery of public value and in public interest, we are consider um, the frameworks should be by government officials or public authorities, and they should be creating um, conducive frameworks as well for other stakeholders to contribute towards public good. So it's all part of a component of governance. Now, also, parts of our discussions include the idea that we are seeing increasingly complex societal problems. So we have explored different examples and so on, and we have seen there is a tendency to just speak of technology as the solution to everything. Yes, technology is there to help us and to help us innovate. However, when we see increasingly complex societal problems, 
and we are seeing, seeing increasingly digitalized society. It doesn't mean that it's the most efficient or the most the smartest approach that we are having towards governance. So for increasingly complex societal problems, is there a question of um, the same old practices of public management? And just you know, using the blanket of technology to appear as innovative. Another component that we have also considered during our discussion is that of different practices of governance. Yes, we have started with uh, exploring Mauritius a little bit in our earlier uh, discussions, but we are considering how uh, on the wider uh, continent in Africa, how there are different practices of governance there, and there are different socio-historical contexts for us to consider that influence on how you know, governance is delivered and the degree of how we understand public value. So ultimately as well, we have been thinking how alongside the discussion of public values, we can embed smartness alongside it. So this is how it leads us to come up with the idea of talking about governance associated with public values and also being smart about it. So that's just in a nutshell to give you an idea of how we have explored our three different disciplines and we came up with, uh, with the center's idea. So briefly, our purpose, um, we are not reinventing the wheel here. Uh, there is existing work uh, being done on the subject. What we want to do is to raise awareness about instances of good practices which are working um, on the island and of course, um, wider context of Africa. And of course, areas where we see that uh, gaps, there are gaps in performance of public sector organizations. We wish to identify that and perhaps to make recommendations as to how they can be improved. So the idea as well is to continue uh, contributing to discussions on the improvement of the quality of governance. And um, that will require us um, to recommend smart led and public values uh, governance approaches. Ultimately on that long journey <clears throat> that we are envisaging, so we are thinking of exploring new approaches for the development of theories in organization studies and public management. Again, we are not reinventing the wheel here. We acknowledge there is existing work happening. What we want to do as a center is to be part of the conversation on uh, African governance, is to contribute to discussions and conversation on the topic, and of course, to push forward those discussions. That, those are the aims of our center. And for that purpose, we have for uh, this um, first year, came up with a series of um, webinar topics, which Imam Din will now share. Thank you, Adila, for this introduction. Yes, exactly. Um, we started to, in order to launch um, the center, we want to discuss uh, or we want to set up four webinars during this year with the main concept um, that our center is, is discussing and reflecting on. So today we start with, with the concept of public value governance, um, uh, which is a quite well established, but also an upcoming concept uh, in the discussion of public management. We went then in the next webinar, look at what does it then actually mean, the African context, what are conditions, um, how we can understand it and study it from a different viewpoint in the third webinar, we rather want to go into the e-government issues, um, the smart government issues, so how new technologies can help in order to um, support and create the public value. And we want to uh, wrap up all this discussion, find the synthesis um, in our last webinar at the end of the year, uh, in order to build up uh, new research topics to look at for the next upcoming years. Um, please, exactly. <clears throat> so as said, public value governance, the topic of today. Um, I always say that the uh, public administration and public sector organizations change throughout the time. 
and it often depends exactly what are the main trends, what are the main uh, discussions, worldwide dis discussions going on that influence the way how public sector organization is, is uh, set up and what is its main goals actually to do. And uh, in a way we can discuss for of, of course, really simplified of three phases. Phase one, um, when the classical bureaucracy as Max Weber introduced it was set up, when everything the uh, public sector administration was structured in clear hierarchies, uh, everything needed to be transparent, it needed to be written down, it was clear the competences. So there was a mindset behind of it that addressed the, the trends of nation buildings when the law of order needed to be uh, respected. So it was important to have a, a public sector organization that really addresses to make sure that the, the law of order is respected, there's no uh, corruption, etc. going on. But this, with the time, created also some tensions, especially in time of globalization. So when we entered into phase two, when there was much more a competition among uh, the different countries and therefore also the state needed to be attractive, it needed to be efficient and effective. And then the discussion of the new public management came up, transformation of public sector organizations, uh, work on indicators, work with the global budget um, was kind of the, the second phase. But today we are in a world um, confronted with new technologies, the digitalization and information technology. Um, so we have a really vast exchange of information we have a lot of independencies and making problems much more complex. We can see that today, but at the same time, we can also perceive scenarios and act in at once. And I think this is exactly what public value governance tries to do, tries to uh, tackle these complex problems that we face today. And by in integrating a lot of different stakeholders, find a new way uh, in order to find better solution and um, create and add to the public value. So we have today three speakers um, that I believe can um, address this question from different viewpoints. Professor Jacob, uh, Jacob Torfing from Roskilde University in Denmark. Um, he did a lot of research about public value uh, and public value governance. I will go a bit, uh, make a bit uh, further introduction in a few minutes. Uh, the second presentation will be held by Professor Lohan Petsch, who also did a lot on governance, particularly from on the European perspective, but provides also a lot of learnings, um, what is working there, what isn't working there. And I think that's gonna be also quite interesting discussion. And we have as a third presenter, Kelly Culver, who uh, did a lot of consulting uh, around public sector transformations all over the world in different Commonwealth countries. And I think she can also provide another uh, perspective talking from her experiences uh, on this topic. So let's start with Jacob Torfing. I said he's professing politics and institutions at the Roskilde University. So different topics he looked at amongst others is public sector reforms. Uh, he looked at network governance and also quite interesting on collaborative innovation. So in broad, I think what you really try to touch on is to understand how the co-creation uh, solutions can, can be a way in order to find new innovative solutions exactly to uh, tackle complex social problems. So I think that goes at the core of what public value governance is and you want to uh, provide an input on public value governance as a game changer. So I'm really looking forward. And I think that's gonna be a really interesting basis to understand what you can learn from it, what we can learn for our discussion um, also for the African context. So um, please, um, uh, I think we, do you have a presentation, Jacob or? Okay. Yes. So then we stop. I'll, I'll share it with you as, as soon as I'm allowed to. Yeah. Hello. Okay, I'm now sorry. I think it's come. You can see? Um, yes, we can. 
Okay, I'll put it in presentation mode. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you for having me. I'm Jacob, um, and I'm very happy to be invited uh, to this event. I think it's an exciting endeavor, uh, a very interesting agenda you have in the new center, and I'm very happy to be able to contribute. And um, what I'll talk about today is based on a special issue of uh, policy and politics, uh, the British uh, Journal, uh, where we have um, a whole special issue with articles uh, on public uh, value governance. And uh, I contributed with two articles and uh, based on, on those articles, I'll give you this small talk about public value management as a game changer. Uh, so where I will start is where where we also were just a minute ago with the with the good old bureaucracy and talk a little about the rise of bureaucracy because when the public sector started to uh, to expand after the Second World War, uh, it's expanded in in many countries in Europe and and also in the rest of the world, the kind of public sector that that expanded was bureaucratic, and um, I think. There's something interesting going on because today we we use a bureaucracy almost in a derogatory way, right? We when 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 you say, oh, that sounds very bureau bureaucratic, it 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 literally means, you know, you must be stupid. You know, this is a very bad solution because today we the connotation of bureaucracy is very bad. But when bureaucracy started to expand in the whole world, and especially after the Second World War, it was really a great improvement compared to earlier uh, forms of public administration. Because centralized control and horizontal specialization uh, in various agencies and departments and so on really helped us to enhance efficiency in the public sector. And the emphasis on rule following, following explicit written down rules and, and the whole idea of a meritocratic a recruitment of public employees, you know, based on their competences and their formal training and et cetera, all that really helped to end corruption or at least uh, uh, mitigate uh, the problem of corruption in many countries. So uh, I just think it's important we never, never to forget that bureaucracy was such an improvement to what we had before uh, in, in many countries. And still, I think in those countries where bureaucracy is still not implemented fully, uh, you know, that is also a problem in many of these countries because bureaucracy brings so many good things with it. You know, uh, uh, legality, uh, transparency, all these public values are associated with uh, bureaucracy. Um, in some uh, countries, in some countries, bureaucracy was also combined with the um, professional rule. And professional rule is really about giving frontline staff, frontline personnel, quite a lot of professional autonomy in exchange for delivering high performance in welfare services. So we have seen that in some, but not all countries. Denmark is a perfect example. We have bureaucracy uh, combined with professional rule. Uh, uh, we ha still have a lot of centralized governance uh, from the national uh, level, but at the local level, we give our professional uh, uh, personnel quite a lot of uh, degrees of freedom and, and autonomy to use their competences to produce high quality services. So there's a kind of a tacit agreement here about you know, trying to balance central, centralized rulemaking uh, and compliance uh, with local autonomy and uh, et cetera. So what happened uh, was that uh, after we had had a few decades of expansion of bureaucracy, that kind of fostered or generated a completely new national sport in many countries. And the new sport was bureaucracy bashing. There were an increasing literature uh, criticizing bureaucracy for all kinds of things. So one of the, the, the very famous uh, starting points was Anthony Down's book, uh, Inside Bureaucracy, where he complained about the ossification of public organizations. He basically argued that public uh, bureaucracies would grow and grow, and you spend an increasing amount of their resources and energy on internal coordination and external turf wars. And that would leave very little resource for innovation or renewal, and public bureaucracies would become more and more rigid, more and more ossified. We saw how Niskanen, he, he problematized bureaucracy's ability to provide services. And he claimed that services, public services in bureaucracy would uh, very often be very poor standard and, and too expensive. Uh, Janne Reglane, 
Swedish professor, he, uh, he started using the principal agency theory on the public sector quite a lot and argued that public employees, due to the, the information asymmetry, would, would find ways of exploiting the lack of control in the public sector to act opportunistically. And finally, we have you know, former president, President Re Ronald Reagan, who said, public bureaucracy is not the solution, but the problem. You know, it cannot be more clear that what we saw in the, in the 80s and the 90s, what was a lot of bureaucracy bashing, bureaucracy being, you know, uh, scapegoated for all kinds of bad things in the world. And neoliberals all over the world criticized public bureaucracy for being almost like a blood-sucking parasite, squandering value produced in the private sector. And therefore, it comes as no surprise that the cure suggested by new public management was to have less of this uh, failing public state bureaucracy and more competitive markets, because uh, we should have less of this uh, attempt to squander money produced by the uh, private sector. So this was uh, the second chapter in the story of bureaucracy. And what comes next? was of course a very important moment uh, with the discovery of public value. So um, one of the big problems actually with this bureaucracy bashing was that it kind of led to, a, I think we can call it an inferiority complex in the public sector that was highly demotivating for many public uh, employees. You know, having been told almost every day in the media, in the press and everywhere that public employees are lazy, they're not doing their job. And there's all this red tape in the public sector. It's horrible. Uh, let's get rid of the public sector. That was such a demotivating factor all through the 80s and 90s. But fortunately, we had this discovery of public value. Harvard professor Mark Moore perfectly well demonstrated that the public sector uh, is not merely squandering value produced in the private sector. No, no, no. The public sector is producing its own distinct value, public value. And public value defined as both as what has value to the public and what the publics in the plural value. And of course, that also means that public value has a certain ambiguity because when we think about producing public value, we try to produce something that we believe is good for society. But there's another side to public value also, which is what people actually value, uh, what the different publics actually value and, and perceive as valuable. And there's no guarantee that what we think is good for the public is also what the publics value. So there's a certain ambiguity, I think, in the term that we have to pay attention to in our research. OK. Um, so what was uh, very interesting about Mark Moore's public value uh, management perspective was the idea that he, you know, he kind of portrayed public managers in a new way. And he portrayed very much public managers as a kind of entrepreneurial explorers who were constantly looking out for or searching for new ways of producing public value. So he has this famous example with a chief librarian uh, who uh, who observes that some you know young kids comes into the library and are noisy every afternoon, and that gets him to kind of ask himself, maybe there should also be public value for these youngsters in the library. Maybe the library is not only about middle class uh, 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 semi-retired people coming into to uh, uh, to loan a book or something. And so he started, you know, the whole idea was that public managers should be these explorers, these entrepreneurs, constantly searching for new ways of producing public value. But of course, living in a bureaucracy, uh, 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 in a democracy, sorry, in a democracy, we cannot have public managers to single-handedly decide what is public value, what has value for the public. So therefore, Mark Moore insisted that public managers should go to what he calls their authorizing environment and get authorization of their new ideas for public value production with elected politicians and various stakeholders. And then when public managers had formulated their public value proposition and this public value proposition was validated and authorized by elected politicians and stakeholders, they should go back to their organization and build 
the organizational capacity, that would mean that they could actually realize the new value proposition and deliver a new public value to the public. <clears throat> so um, I think this was a crucial discovery, the whole public value perspective. But um, Mark Moore's initial formulation of public value management has also been criticized uh, for being too managerial. Uh, and kind of in the first book uh, from 1995, the perspective is that it's really public managers who are in charge of producing public value. But I think that later research, uh, Jerry Stoker and many other, uh, John Bryce and Barbara Grosby, myself, many others have argued that it's not only uh, managers, public managers, but actually a broad range of public and private actors, including citizens, neighborhood, civil society, et cetera, who can all contribute somehow to public value production. And that is why I claim in my research that public value, the very notion of public value is a game changer because it opens up for a new perspective, uh, namely co-creation. Uh, it, it leads us to embrace co-creation of public value involving a plethora of public and private actors, including citizens in networks and partnerships uh, where we have um, uh, mutual learning, innovation, and ultimately the production of public value. Uh, and when I talk about co-creation, I define it as when two or more public and private actors collaborate to both define common problems and also design and implement new and better solutions. And this definition of co-creation means, of course, that it is not co-creation. And please don't mistake this. It's not co-creation when citizens are consulted in the last minute about public planning decisions. It's not co-creation when public tasks are dumped at the feet of weak local communities who cannot shoulder the burden. And it's not co-creation when public service production is contracted out to private contractors. Co-creation involves collaboration between relevant and affected actors early in the process where problems are defined and then solutions designed and implemented. And just to give you a very quick glimpse of why I think co-creation is very different from what we, uh, the way we used to govern, try to look at this slide. So at the left hand, uh, on the slide, we have the standard chain of government where voters elect politicians who make laws, communicate these laws to the administration who will instruct professionals uh, to deliver services to clients. What I always was curious about, what I always wondered about was how on earth we could build a public governance system in this format where we allow public and private actors to do each their job in a series of actions and never working together. So it is amazing that we build this linear system of government, a chain of government, where all these different actors, they each come in and do their part of the show, and they're never sitting around the same table and, and asking themselves, what is the problem and what could be uh, an appropriate solution providing value to us all? That is exactly what we try to achieve through co-creation. Co-creation is exactly the idea that each of these many public and private actors, they must step out of their comfort zone, each of their comfort zones and enter a common space where they define problems and design and implement solutions jointly with each other and build what in the literature is called collaborative advantage. All those things we can do together, but never alone. And um, I think Great achievements, potential achievements are there to, uh, to harvest from co-creation. Uh, we will have much higher service quality if we have co-creation and involve citizens and get to know their, uh, you know, their, their needs and experiences. We will be able to hit the target much more easily in the public sector. Co-creation will also strengthen co social cohesion. And we are struggling with a lot of polarization in our societies. Co-creation is bringing people together at, around concrete problem solving. And that is such a good and healthy thing for democracy. 
Co-creation also stimulates innovation. And more than that, it builds an, a joint and common ownership to new and bold solution that helps to mitigate implementation resistance. And finally, co-creation can also have a democratizing effect on governance because we tend to involve more actors and people and citizens at the output side of the political system. We are so used to think about democracy uh, as being something about voters uh, uh, electing politicians at the input side of the political system. But co-creation allows us to democratize uh, the production of solutions, the creation of solutions at the output side. Okay, um, finally, I see a great uh, future for local co-creation all over the world, including Africa and, and many places in the world, a local co-creation of global sustainable development goals. So I, I'm in my research very, very interested in, in the United Nations sustainable development goals. And it's interesting to see that there have only been three unanimous decisions ever in the history of the United Nations. That was first, the formation of the United Nations, then the, the agreement about the human declaration of rights, and then the sustainable development goals. And the sustainable development goals are so important because it's our, it's, it's the goals of all of us. It's not the, the goals of governments or citizens or business firms. It's the it's our it's our everybody's goals. And what is also interesting with the SDGs of the Sustainable Development Goals is that they come with their own recipe. Um, so goal 17, the, the, the 17th goal of the SDGs is exactly that the first 16 goals should be created through, uh, should even be co-created through networks and partnerships, bringing public and private actors together. And that's what I'm currently writing a book about with um, my good colleague, Eva Sorensen, and also my colleague, uh, Chris Ansel from UC Berkeley. We are writing a book called Local Co-Creation of Global Sustainability Goals, uh, Goal 17 as a Lever of Change. And we are writing it with uh, three top level people from the UN. And we hope this uh, book will, it will be golden open access to be read freely by everybody from Copenhagen to Cape Town. Um, and therefore, uh, we hope it will stimulate co-creation of the planetary survi survival. And here's a little more readings for you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor Tolfin. Um, very um, insightful um, um, uh, presentation on the topic of uh, co-creation. And we have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> Just maybe quickly. Um, yes. I think we do it like this. If you have at the moment just a, a question kind of of clarification or something like that, I think that's the moment to ask. But the discussions then, um, as said, after we have the three presentations, then we start the discussion. And so when you have comments, etc., uh, I think that would be the moment uh, to raise. But if you have some clarification questions, please uh, raise it up now. Okay, I um, yeah, I think that's good. There are some questions about the slides, but I think that will be manageable we, uh, if they can be shared. And um, I think then we go to the next presentation. Yep. So yes, uh, Professor Tesh, you should be able to share your screen if you have any slides uh, that you wish to share. Um, a brief introduction of uh, Professor Laurent Pesch. Uh, he's a Jean Monnet Professor of European Union Public Law, and he's the Head of Law and Politics Department at the main campus of Middlesex University in London. And uh, Professor Pesch has written extensively uh, <clears throat> on subjects such as the rule of law in the EU, the scope of application of European human rights standards, and the right to free speech in comparative law. So his current primary area of research is the rule of law backsliding in Europe. Uh, in addition to being a great colleague and head of department, uh, Professor Laurent Pesch as well, his head is uh, also wanted by several uh, governments as well. Sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> um, uh, um, I had to say that pun. 
because Professor Pesh is really um, a great advocate about the respect of rule of law. And he has written extensively on the rule of law backsliding in the European Union. So um, he said that he's, it's not just a theoretical risk, it is something which is happening and the dangers and threats associated with that. So <clears throat> we look forward to having a different perspective on the topic, namely focusing on principles uh, and uh, good values of uh, the European Union. Uh, my, my notes just fell down. That's why <laughs> I will let Professor Pesh um, introduce the title of his presentation, which we look forward to hearing. Thank you very much, Adila, and thank you for having me. Uh, I hope uh, I shall be able to I'll be able to see you guys uh, soon in uh, person in Mauritius, uh, hopefully next year. Uh, so today, uh, essentially, uh, as Adila mentioned, uh, my main area of expertise is uh, respect for the rule of law. Uh, but today, I'm going mostly to give you an overview of uh, good governance. Uh, in the EU uh, uh, legal framework. I'm a lawyer, so obviously I'm going to focus on uh, rules and how they've been implemented uh, within the EU framework. And I'm going to try to essentially uh, summarize uh, what has been happening in the past uh, 20 years as regards uh, good governance uh, slash good global governance in the EU uh, framework. Uh, why am I mentioning a good governance and good global governance? Because these are the two key concepts uh, to be found in the EU treaties. So long story short, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you have studied EU law. If you haven't, uh, let me uh, just uh, say that the EU is essentially based on two main uh, treaties, essentially that they constitute the constitution of the EU. And interestingly enough, uh, since the Treaty of Lisbon, these two treaties uh, were amended and now mention good global governance and good governance. Now, let me tell you about good global governance and then I'll tell you about good governance. Uh, good global governance is to be found in the title dedicated to the EU's foreign policy or EU's external uh, relations. Uh, there is, a, I mean, I can give you the number of the article if you're interested, it's easy uh, to find, but it's article 21 uh, to uh, subparagraph H, there is a reference to good global governance. This is the first time, I mean, in 2010 was the first time the EU uh, treaties included this uh, explicit reference to good global governance. Now, what does this provision is about? This provision is about um, essentially uh, um, making clear that the EU must define common policies and common actions in order to promote an international system based on stronger multilateral cooperation and good global governance. So good global governance has an external dimension in EU law. So good global governance is only to be found in the context of EU external relations law. Uh, internally, uh, we use a different concept. I mean, essentially, the concept of good governance, you just drop the global, and then that's the internal dimension of good governance in the EU, at least from a legal point of view. And good governance, uh, for the first time, uh, was inserted in the European treaties in 2010 again. And it can be found in Article 15 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, where there is a reference to the uh, promotion of good governance and ensuring the participation of civil society. So there is, there is a reference to good governance as regards the need for EU institutions to, in, uh, to involve essentially what we would call stakeholders and do so in a transparent manner. So transparency is also another important uh, legal principle which has gained a lot of importance in EU law in the past uh, 20 years. There is another title of the Treaty on European Union, which may be of interest to you, uh, is the title on democracy. Uh, this title, uh, it's actually Article 11, uh, if you want to have a number. Uh, lawyers uh, love to refer to uh, tr treaty provisions or legal provisions by their numbers. Uh, so forgive me for this sin. So it's Article 11 of the TU. There is no mention now of good governance in this uh, uh, treaty title. So actually all the principles, most of the principles mentioned in this uh, treaty provision reflect uh, good governance uh, principles as they are normally understood at least uh, by most uh, European lawyers. And they're good governance principles associated with what I think uh, can be called the participatory democracy model. So the EU is actually uh, based on three models of democracy, 
the, the traditional uh, representative democratic model. Uh, direct democracy is also um, uh, taken into account, but uh, uh, with the Treaty of Lisbon in the past 20 years, the EU has tried to give more room to what is called participatory democracy. What does that mean in practical terms? In fact, uh, it's quite directly connected to the first presentation in a way. It's about involving uh, stakeholders uh, when uh, decisions have to be made. Uh, so there is an obligation, there are several obligations on EU institutions to uh, involve uh, citizens and representative associations. So these two uh, groups are mentioned explicitly uh, in EU law. An EU institution must make, uh, 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 so must give uh, citizens and representative association a chance to be involved in the EU's decision-making processes. There is also a new obligation on the EU to organize an open, transparent and regular dialogue uh, with uh, representative associations and civil society. So this is also the first time civil society was mentioned in the, what is essentially the EU's constitution. So all of these uh, changes are quite new when introduced, but uh, what we call the Treaty of Lisbon, so a treaty amending the, the two treaties I've mentioned which was signed in the, the Portuguese city of Lisbon. This is why EU lawyers like to refer uh, to it as the, the Lisbon Treaty. Um, so uh, what is interesting also is that good governance and good global governance are not defined uh, in the treaty. So both are mentioned in the EU treaties, but the EU treaties do not tell us uh, much more uh, than essentially what they mean, uh, apart from a set of new obligations imposed on EU institutions. Now, this is not uh, unusual. Uh, the EU treaties are quite long already as they are, about 500 pages long. So we cannot uh, spend more pages defining every single concept. Uh, so this is why, uh, as was expected, uh, EU institutions then spend uh, quite some time essentially putting flesh to the bones of the two concepts, implementing these provisions. And this is what uh, the second half of my presentation, I'm gonna tell you now, about how good global governance and good governance were implemented in practical terms, or at least uh, were tried to be implemented by EU institutions. And I'm going to distinguish between the internal dimension, so good governance, and then I'm going to finish with the external dimension, uh, so how good global governance has been applied in practical terms by the EU. Now, from an internal point of view, actually, um, the main focus uh, of EU institutions has been on so-called better regulation, which was uh, a, few, a few years ago redefined as smart regulation. Now, don't ask me what's the difference between better regulation in EU law and smart regulation. It's mostly a, a rebranding exercise as far as I can see. It started actually, this uh, better regulation agenda started before the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, which entered into force in 2010. The first key document from an EU law point of view, if you're interested, is the European Commission White Paper on European Governance of 2001. So this is essentially, if, if I have to tell you to read one document, I would say this is the key document uh, in the, uh, for uh, the EU the European Commission White Paper on European Governance, which was widely uh, discussed uh, when it was uh, published in 2001. Now, why um, did we have this uh, white paper on better governance in 2001? At the time, uh, so there was a discussion about how to improve the legitimacy of the EU's decision-making processes. And there was a lot of criticism of the traditional decision-making process known as the so-called uh, EC, e so European community method. I don't want to bore you to death if you're not an EU law hardcore fan, but essentially the old fashioned way of making regulations in the EU has always been essentially the commission making proposals, then the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers adopting these proposals and implementation to be done by national authorities with the commission and then judicial review organized by the European Court of Justice. So this has been the traditional decision-making or law-making uh, processes. It's called the community method in EU law. Now, in 2001, the European Commission decided that perhaps it was time to at least uh, look whether this community method was effective enough uh, from a regulation point of view. And the conclusion was that we could complement it uh, with a possibly a less top-down uh, approach and increasing the use of non-legislative instruments. So in a way, better regulation is kind of a, uh, an implicit criticism 
of uh, lawyers and the force of law as a, as a mean of changing or regulating uh, people's behavior. So that's kind of the underlying force uh, behind the European Commission white paper. Uh, now, in practical terms, uh, uh, what happened after this uh, white paper? Uh, the EU institutions started, I, I guess the most decisive impact of this uh, better regulation agenda was the introduction of impact assessments. So impact assessments uh, gained a lot of uh, strength, uh, more wide, they, were, they became more widespread. Uh, and in fact, uh, better regulation unit uh, was in fact created to make sure that impact assessments were uh, uh, properly done. Yeah. And this impact assessments, part of this better regulation agenda, had to be done uh, in consultation with stakeholders. So it's a bit what uh, uh, I guess it's directly connects to what Jacob was saying about uh, co-participation and uh, essentially uh, co-production of uh, norms uh, broadly understood. Uh, what was new also, uh, um, and very trendy, uh, no longer so much, um, for 10 years, 10 or 15 years, uh, self-regulation and co-regulation were quite uh, heavily promoted by EU institutions. So instead of uh, old-fashioned uh, command and control type of regulation, the EU institutions were pushing for self-regulation by private parties and then co-regulation, so where you have a mix of public authorities essentially uh, interacting with private actors to define the norms of a particular sector. Uh, this is less popular these days uh, because in most cases, self-regulation and co-regulation uh, have not worked. We have had a, a lot of scandals in the EU uh, with uh, co-regulation mechanisms. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, the mechanism involving big techs. So essentially co-regulation as regards the, the internet, hate speech, uh, Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 hasn't worked. Uh, co-regulation has also had bad press after essentially uh, a, German car industry scandal uh, involving the commission and essentially uh, production of false data regarding the impact. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna stop there. Uh, let's just say the bottom line is self-regulation and co-regulation in 2021 is less uh, popular than it was uh, five or 10 years ago. Uh, that being said, uh, the past 20 years essentially have seen uh, the rise of uh, non-legislative instruments being used more by EU institutions. So less command and control type of regulation and uh, an increasing use of uh, non-traditional uh, regulation uh, approaches from an EU law point of view. So this is essentially the internal dimension. This week, actually, we're gonna get uh, new guidelines on data regulation in the EU. Uh, uh, just to give you uh, in a nutshell what's going to happen, essentially, it's kind of a updating of the principle that every time we adopt a new regulation in the EU, we should uh, repeal a previous one. Uh, this principle has been controversial because uh, most people said, uh, and I, I would tend to agree, it's, it's too mecha mechanical. Uh, what we need is better regulation, but better regulation doesn't necessarily mean uh, fewer regulation. Uh, but uh, this is how, how it has been understood by some in the EU. So for some people, better regulation simply means uh, less uh, uh, legal norms, uh, less uh, regulation instruments. And now uh, let me just finish with uh, the external dimension of uh, better regulation in the EU. Uh, you have uh, good global governance uh, in the treaty, but uh, essentially it doesn't tell you what it is. Uh, uh, so the job of defining what good global governance means uh, has been left to the council and the European parliament. And they've adopted a lot of uh, financial trade and cooperation agreements uh, or regulations. Uh, I can mention one, for instance, a uh, famous one, which is the Cotonou Agreement, so which is a big uh, trade agreement with ACP uh, countries. I think Mauritius is part of the ACP countries, but uh, Adila can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but the Cotonou Agreement essentially refers to uh, uh, the need to respect human rights, democratic principles, the rule of law and good governance. Uh, what is perhaps interesting uh, to uh, note is that good governance and the rule of law are quite often uh, uh, mentioned together in the same breath uh, in EU instruments. Uh, they're not always defined, uh, but when they are defined, or at least when they are detailed, uh, they tend to be understood uh, at uh, essentially at least uh, entailing effective public administration. 
impartial and effective judiciary, and then effective uh, fight against corruption and fraud. So this is essentially the basic understanding of good governance, especially when it is uh, connected to the rule of law. Uh, you have dozens and dozens of instruments, uh, mostly actually uh, binding instruments, uh, which refer to good governance. There is a lot of money at play here from an EU law point of view. Uh, the EU does uh, essentially has set aside for the next uh, seven years, uh, I think about 20, between 20 and 40 billion euros. Actually, I need to check the latest figures to promote good governance in an external relations. But to conclude, and this is essentially my, uh, I just have one point to conclude my presentation. Uh, it's very nice to seek to promote a good governance, but you can only do so uh, and be credible when actually your house is in order. And sadly, as Adila was mentioning uh, in uh, introduction, uh, the EU has now, I'm afraid, the world's top two autocratizing countries in the world. So the EU currently uh, within its midst as a, a country which is a member state, even though it's no longer a democracy, Hungary. And Poland is the number one country in the world, according to democracy experts, in terms of dismantling democracy and the rule of law, which obviously makes it uh, quite uh, difficult to be seen as a credible actor when it comes to promoting uh, good global governance or good go governance. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Laurent Pesch. And yes, I confirm Mauritius is part of the uh, ACB, uh, uh, Cotonou Agreement, and it was part of a steering committee as well, leading it some time ago. So yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, a lot to learn. And um, and yes, uh, um, we, well, I don't know if, Amandine, how do we do it? Should we leave questions um, till the end? Yeah, I think so, right? Yeah, unless there is a question of clarification, something. No, no, no. So, yeah. Let's, um, yeah. So uh, there is a question from Professor uh, Jacob Tofin. Are we not seeing a shift from hard to soft law? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, an interesting point. I would say there was a shift uh, in, uh, let's say, the, the first, after the white paper on European governance, there was a strong shift towards uh, soft law, increasing use of non-legislative instruments. I've seen the reverse now. Uh, so uh, essentially, we've come back to the uh, situation before 2001 because of uh, the scandals surrounding uh, co-regulation mechanisms especially. Uh, so uh, what we have learned, I guess, is that co-regulation and self-regulation can only work really if you're dealing with good faith uh, private actors uh, and that you have effective dissuasive enforcement mechanisms when these uh, mechanisms fail. So in, they only work in the shadow of, I think, old fashioned uh, regulations. Um, so I'm afraid uh, we're back to a more simplistic view of better regulation, which is essentially uh, where the commission is uh, pleased just to repeal instruments every time uh, they adopt the new instruments. But it doesn't mean that we in a situation where regulation has become better. It's just uh, essentially has become more of a, a quantitative exercise rather than a qualitative exercise. And I don't think that's healthy. Thank you, Professor. Um, 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 Kelly, um, if you wish to share your screen, if you have any slides to share, feel free to do so. Great, I do. Exactly. I just make a brief introduction uh, for Kelly. Uh, so Kelly Culver, um, she's the founder of the Culver Group and the partner of ECART. I think she's really an entrepreneurship or a public entrepreneurship by itself did a lot of consulting on public sector transformation really across the globe for different organizations such as the Commonwealth Secretary, the UN. Um, just to mention a few countries she's worked in, uh, at the moment she's consulting the Swiss Development Corporation, she consulted the, the UNFPA in Namibia, she was working in Mauritius, Barbados, uh, Belize, St. Lucia, Antigua and Barbados, just to mention a few. And I thought that would be really interesting to have, to share her experience on public sector transformation, on public value governance, as she has seen a lot of different settings, mainly in Commonwealth countries, but from different continents in Africa, in Canada. And um, so I'm really looking forward to the presentation. We see here the title, Public Value Governance in Practice Across the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly, and the stage is yours. 
Well, thank you very much, Emmy. I appreciate it. And, uh, and to all of the other organizers and uh, co-collaborators, it's great to be here. So I wanted to start with um, this, perhaps, a definition for me around public value governance. And, and you know, we've heard Professor Torfing speak to this as well. But for me, if I want to put it in a nutshell, public value governance is a response to the challenges of a networked, multi-sector, no one wholly in charge world. In the new approach, values beyond efficiency and effectiveness, which I would argue is the old model, and especially democratic values are prominent, which is the citizen-centric new model. And government has a special role to play as a guarantor of public values, but citizens as well as businesses and nonprofit organizations are also important as active problem solvers in the University of Minnesota. Um, for me, uh, my discussion with you today, I'm going to frame um, my experiences across the Commonwealth around this definition and from a practitioner's perspective. I wanted to pick up on two things, um, going back to um, Professor Torfing, around governance. Um, in international development, international cooperation, governance now has become a cross-cutting issue. It's no longer standalone. It's no longer a silo. Um, element or uh, phenomena. We're looking at governance um, cross-cutting in terms of the environment, health, um, how we design service delivery, the digital life, and inclusivity. So it's become um, that one common theme or that one element that can ground all of the work that we do. So this is my workplace. Emmy gave a bit of a, a bit of a quick overview, but this is my workplace. So I live and work uh, around the world. Right now I'm in Canada, um, but uh, probably will be traveling again towards the, the end of the year. And I've worked with the UN and the World Bank and the Commonwealth Secretariat and various different governments around governance, public sector transformation. And I like to describe myself as a, as a uh, global social entrepreneur because I, um, I have some consultancy companies and a, and a foundation on innovation that I just started in the Netherlands. But moving on to this, public value governance for me, what is it? So if a really quick definition is, it's a system and a process to tackle collabor and collaboratively solve complex, wicked problems. So if we take this apart just for a minute, and I relate it to international development, global sustainability has been on the international agenda for decades and yet long-term change has been difficult to achieve. In our world, um, my observation is that challenges are becoming more wicked, more complex, they're interconnected, and change is happening at an often constant and unprecedented rate. So collaboration, co-creation, and co-production are needed to achieve faster and more impactful outcomes. I'd like to stop here for a minute and say that Professor Torfing and I did not compare notes before we created our presentations, but what we're talking about is very similar from an academic and from a practitioner point of view. Countries, governments, and corporations and organizations need to respond really rapidly to these changing and dynamic circumstances with strategically resilient, adaptive, and innovative sustainable solutions. Public value governance is a way to achieve these ends if you frame things around public value governance. So what's a wicked problem? The concept of wicked problem uh, came up in, in sort of urban planning in the 70s, but it's, it's really permeating what we do in around international cooperation now. And so if the problem, if there's an issue where the solution requires a number of people to change their mindsets and behaviors, it's more than likely a wicked problem. And wicked problems tend to get really messy. I like working in, in the wicked problem environment because I find that these types of issues can spark positive inclusive disruption. And the wicked problem model is one that has been used extensively in the Caribbean as part of their public value governance toolkit. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But I'll, I'll give you a concrete example of a wicked problem. Um, there's a growing body of innovation work that's led by the UN Development Programs Accelerator Lab Network that approaches sustainable development as a wicked problem with a high level of uncertainty and for which ex-ante targets do not work 
and best practices do not exist. This dynamic new capability for decision makers to explore, experiment, and grow portfolios of mutually reinforcing solutions to tackle today's challenges. Maybe a little clearer, for me, public value governance is about the intersection and interplay between efficiency, effectiveness, resiliency, and relevance. Public value governance allows us to move beyond efficiency and effectiveness towards social impact and fiscal prudence. It becomes a both and, not an either or. Public value governance allows us to look at the world in a both and lens as opposed to either we are efficient or we are effective. With public value governance, you can be all, it's both and all. Uh, and for me, the essence of public value governance is that how, that shift around the how. So we can see an interplay with efficiency and effectiveness between the public and private sectors, between public officials and elected officials, between government and its stakeholders. Efficiency uh, in, the, in the old model is about controlling costs, but at what cost? And so some lessons uh, from right now, we have examples with COVID and the cost of outsourcing production at the risk of national security or national due diligence in providing necessary health and well-being tools and environment. This certainly happened in Canada. We outsourced um, our we outsourced too many things to be able to respond quickly to uh, the situation in what, that we were facing. We're seeing evidence also um, right now that organizational identity and culture is being impacted by the work at home or virtual work rule. You can argue that it might be efficient, but there's an impact on effectiveness and a loss of human dimension and dynamics that directly impacts organizational identity, culture, and the sense of a common purpose. A good example, uh, when a year ago in, in Mar uh, March, a year ago, Twitter gave $1,000 to each of its employees, said stay home, buy the um, equipment that you need to work from home and for 80% of you, we're not going to bring you back into the workforce. What we're seeing around this, uh, this use of technology, we, we're creating um, a dual landscape because we are still leaving some people behind that, that principal tenant of the sustainable development goals, leave no one behind, we're leaving a whole bunch of people behind. Uh, in, in this adoption to almost technology at all costs. And what that does is provides a risk of fragmentation for our organizations around that sense of common purpose. So for me, effectiveness is more important than efficiency. The, effective, the efficiency perspective where, where we focused on the shareholder has to be weighed more carefully in understanding the public value Effectiveness, especially in the citizen-centric model, includes relevance, resiliency, and trustworthiness. Public sector organizations must stay relevant or they become obsolete. They must be resilient to adapt to changing stakeholder expectations. And at the same time, the public has to have trust in them. These things go hand in hand because being relevant and resilient makes an organization or a government trustworthy of its clients. So one of the questions Emmy asked me to answer this morning is how do public sector organizations achieve public value governance? And I would like to propose to you that it's through a variety of different ways. No one is the right way. You can ask the question in a different way. How do public sector organizations need to be positioned in order to tackle complex and wicked problems or in, a, in an increasingly fast changing world? Or you could say, what do public sector organizations have to do to comply with the principles of a public value governance system? So for me, as countries tackle the widening income disparity, environmental issues, employment, education, security, gender inequality, the impact of the current pandemic is having a profound effect on the global economy. And as this crisis continues to unfold, few economic sectors will escape restructuring or replacement. For some time now, governments have been urged to find new ways to work with a more diverse array of people and organizations. I see that in my work all around the world. And while societies and governments have aspired to this for some years, it's now a really important and urgent reality. 
collaboration, co-creation, and co-production are needed to achieve faster and more impactful outcomes. So I'm going to make a very bold statement to you. Purpose is the new currency. And if purpose is the new currency, what is the exchange? Where is the point of collision and with whom? And how do you monetize purpose? The private sector has been grappling with the concept of purpose being the new currency for some time as we look at corporate social responsibility or we look at the environmental social governance um, uh, components of uh, corporate portfolio and how companies are assessed and evaluated by potential shareholders. In the government, in my view, purpose forms the basis of a contract between government and its citizens. And what I mean by that is government creates policy, creates services, creates rules. Citizens agree to live by those rules. They also agree to remit money through taxation to government to be able to provide those services. So there's an element of a contract. It's circular. And public value governance for me is the means by which the contract is executed. Governments with citizen-centric values design their orbit and actions with a user focus. They take the external view rather than what's easiest for us view or how do we maintain our power and control view. Their activities serve their citizens, ensuring that no one is left behind. And by doing this, public sector organizations contribute to the public value and grow public trust. They remain relevant. How do they do this? For me, it's through four tools. There are other tools, but I just wanted to focus on four today. So empathy, a deep understanding of who are we designing for? Who are we collaborating with? What is the problem that we're solving? And we call this ethnography. So empathy is human-centered, and a human-centered approach is your new playbook in public value governance. We're seeing today that human-centered co-creation and collaboration are vital to innovation, to finding solutions, and transforming our world, people, and planet, so that element of the sustainable development goals. Inspiration grabs us at the emotional level and calls us together for something greater. So around that common purpose, common values, common vision. And inspiration is driven by possibilities and options, and it capitalizes on our learning and growing knowledge. Invention, to grow, we need to create something in the future that's different from the present. And Walt Disney, to me, summed that up really well when he said, powerful futures are created first in the mind and next in the activity. And we can't get there unless we collaborate together. And design thinking builds resiliency into organizations and helps get things done. And for me, it's a process to solve wicked complex problems, transforming the way organizations develop their products, services, processes, and strategies. We've seen in the past year how the smallest of events can have large impacts. So a profound understanding of the interrelationship of the system of things is required. In this way, public value governance is a platform for information transparency, for simplicity, for focusing on what is important and for creating user-centric so solutions that help governments pivot quickly, deliver on demand, be agile and build up resilience to disruption. Now around the Commonwealth, um, I have some observations to provide. Since we're coming to you from Mauritius, I'll start with my experience in public sector business transformation. Um, and I would suggest that this particular initiative um, over the last several years was a form of public value governance because its principles were grounded in working more closely with citizens to keep pace with societal changes and demands. So how do we pivot a public sector organization to have more client-centered skills, anticipative planning skills, and creating value that the public needs? Not necessarily that the public wants, but that the public needs. I think we need to differentiate on that piece. Um, it was about adapting and changing the minds of, um, in the midst of uncertainty with all of the disruption, uh, global, political, digital, being open and forward thinking and continuously improving and having in time adjustment. That means staying focused on outcomes. This is really, really, really important. From a results-based management point of view, from the work I do with the government of Switzerland, we are, we are trying to, it's like 
kind of moving the Queen Mary, but we're trying to shift from people focusing on output and focusing on outcome so that we can look at results and we can look at the social impact of those results. Uh, in the Caribbean, in the work that I've done in the Caribbean and in uh, uh, which was a, a leadership program, a seven year leadership program called the Caribbean Leadership Program by Global Affairs Canada. And in Namibia, with the government of Namibia looking at uh, gender equality and gender based violence, um, there's a shift towards social and public entrepreneurship as part of public value governance. And leaders are using their social capital, bringing together disparate groups and adopting a social entrepreneurial mindset in order to create outcomes that citizens want and that the government can deliver using the following strategies. And the strategies are summarized here in the word cloud. So it's about collaborating and network building um, coalitions for change across government, business and civil society, uh, working across systems rather than in systems, building narratives for change, being able to influence, persuade, and sell. And this is a bit risky because you have to persuade your colleagues, sometimes those are co-administrators, politicians, citizens, that in our increasingly blame-driven public sector culture, where public officers are uh, understandably risk averse, there remains an upside to doing something differently. Leveraging new resources, finding new ways of financing public service and development interventions, focusing on outcomes and doing uh, what it takes to achieve the outcome. And again, outcome, not output. Adapting and learning, learning and, and adapting very quickly through adaptive management. Uh, building capacity for public innovation. Innovation is increasingly important in developing countries, helping them unlock the potential of citizens in the co-design and co-delivery of public services. And finally, building readiness for collaboration. So the idea of being able to rock the boat without tipping it over um, with a, a variety um, a coalition of actors. I'll leave you with this. One question that I get asked frequently is, are models of governance easily transportable? Uh, are models of public value governance from Canada, do they fit well in other contexts? And the short answer is no, they don't. And in the longer answer, it depends. So on the left of your screen is a wonderful shot from Malta. And on the right of your screen is a window within a window uh, in Barbados. And I've imposed a Canadian maple leaf and it really is out of place here. It is, the context isn't quite right. So what I've learned from living and working overseas and advising developing countries in, is the Canadian context is it's more than likely irrelevant to their unique set of circumstances. You can't take what works here and expect it to work somewhere else. But what we do share is a, is a common need and desire to build resilience so that our countries and societies successfully adjust and even thrive amid diversity. Every country is looking for the same thing, to be a high income, sustainable, innovative, inclusive economy with modern infrastructure, global connectivity, advanced skills and technology and gender equality. And everyone wants to know that inherently they have value, they have a voice regardless of their perspective, community, or background. And I think, summing it up with public value governance, if you can create a vision and a purpose that people see themselves in, where they see their needs being addressed, so where the shoe pinches for them, then you're more than likely going to have traction and purpose. And to achieve this end, in my experience working across the Commonwealth, public value governance is an important part of your toolkit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, also, at this point, just a question of clarification. No, don't see any reactions. <laughs> Mother's <laughs> <was>, yay. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think we go to the overall discussion. I think that was really interesting. Um, also, thank you, Jacob. You kind of wanted to put a, a title for the overall uh, webinar. Uh, maybe you want to 
uh, share your your ideas behind that or um yeah no it was just it's it struck me that there you know that the three presentations in a way fit well together in the sense that for example in research we have like two strands in public value research there's one strand that is occupied with um, uh, identifying public values uh, you know what are the public values found in the public sector on which we base public governance and for example good governance is really about you know a whole bunch of different values that are important to take into consideration in public governance so so that's what i often refer to as uh, public values in the in the plural and based on these public values we see that increasingly we co-create public value outcomes of public uh, public value uh, uh, solutions. Uh, and, and I think that the last presentation very well pointed to design thinking as one of the very important tools for co-creation because design thinking is really about, you know, starting with the empathy and, and having, uh, you know, um, and fast learning and, and testing of prototypes and making sure that that solutions meet uh, needs rather than demands, uh, as Kelly talked about. So that that so I think the three presentations uh, fit well together in a sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then should we open the floor to questions or? Um... Yeah, I, I think so. Um, are there any questions, comments to the three presentations or to all of them, some of them? Hey, Mam Dean, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, Hi. Hi, everyone. I really enjoyed uh, your presentations. We've had torrential rains here in Mauritius, so it's been a bit kind of crazy today. And I'm not sure really what I'm asking exactly, but um, by the way, um, Kelly, I'm from Canada originally, and my mother's from Barbados. So I guess that's relevant, relevant to what I'm wondering, namely, in the context of the devastating impact of COVID and the undermining of traditional sources of economies, for example, Barbados, as you know, tourism is probably the main industry, yep. Mauritius as well. And so it will be years until tourism you know, recovers to some degree. Probably mass tourism will be affected for years to come. So in that context, and also, for example, when it comes to finance, Barbados is also suffering from, you know, some of the negative um, forces with respect to offshore finance, Mauritius as well. Probably, as you know, Mauritius is on the blacklist of the EU. I mean, yeah, Kelly would definitely know all, that, all this stuff. So in the context of challenges to the traditional underpinnings of particularly these developing economies and considering that governments are increasingly involved in all spheres of the public and as well as private sectors now, with the other COVID levels of debt increasing. And a further twist, in the context of the traditional kind of ascendancy of neoliberal values over the last 30 years, do any of you have any prognostications or thoughts as to where we're going from here and the impact upon public values? So like I said, I'm not sure exactly what I'm wondering, but I found today very stimulating. Um, Thank you, Stephen. Um, shall we take a few more questions uh, of you first and then um, um, address, have our speakers address the questions? Anybody else with a question? I think let, let, let's uh, uh, bring some answers in yeah, to this question and then yeah. take of you. I think you wanted to give an answer. No, I, I... I, I, I was not sure either completely what is the question here, but, but I, I have a response because I think you're very right in pointing out the devastating and tragic consequences of the COVID pandemic on, on many countries. And I think that many countries in the global South will be hurt much more than, than more you know, Western European countries. For example, in Denmark last year, we were surprised to see that our economic growth only fell by 3.5%. That is not a lot. Uh, that is not a, a, a big thing in, in, in a strong economy. And many other countries in the global south are suffering much more, uh, uh, as you pointed out, with you know the, 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 the uh, diminishing of tourism and all this. But then I wanted to, to end this on a positive note, because I think the, the pandemic has also created a new opportunity, because I think the pandemic is the first time the whole, the whole planet has been one 
um, uh, uh, one shared has had one shared destiny. So we have we it, it's kind of created a, a community of destiny, and we all felt in all parts of the world that we were hit by the same disaster, by the same problem, and so on. So it was not earthquake in 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 uh, Turkey and 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 you know uh, drought in 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 uh, in the U.S. or you know problems different problems in all parts of it was the very same problem in the whole world and i think it has created like a new solidarity a new a new way of thinking that we are in it together and we are also facing uh, common problems that we all, uh, must deal with through a coordinated and concerted effort so that's why i actually think that you know there is some some positive learning here uh, and perhaps we can come out stronger uh, with the with the sustainable development goals and and really uh, all believe that these are goals that are important to each and every part of the world. And we have to come together, all countries, all actors to do something about saving the world. Thank you, Professor Tolfin. And Emmanuel, if you allow me, uh, OK, we have another question, actually, uh, from, yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, they are asking whether any empirical tests to measure the value or outcomes of uh, public governance, whether it has been done. Um, for example, in the COVID uh, situation, different countries as independent variable as a measure of value. How do you show that gov good governance according to your definition of creation? Uh, of co-creation has demonstrated value. So far, it seems we need strong state actions. Uh, example, for example, forced quarantine, strong public health capacity to deal with a crisis rather than voluntary actions and compliance by citizens. Isn't there an irony? I think uh, that was going to be one of my questions as well. Um, any, thank you for the question. Anybody would like to take it? I, I, have a go. I, I just yeah. think it's very different from country to country, what has been the reaction and the strategy towards uh, COVID. Uh, in, in Denmark and in many northern European countries, we actually have had quite a, a, a surprisingly collaborative approach. We have had a lot of, you know, um, negotiations between government and interest organizations and business about compensations for lockdowns. Uh, we have had a compensation of all kinds of groups in society, and we have had a mobilization of citizens and civil societies to help people who could not go out to do their own shopping, and to help elderly and people who were particularly vulnerable during the crisis and so on. So we have actually seen kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a rise of collaboration and co-creation and, and, and so on. So, so I think it differs very much from country to country. So actually, I think that we have seen both a lot of top-down bureaucracy and a lot of uh, collaboration and co-creation, but of course, it varies also with state traditions and, 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 and also with the, with the trust in, in the population, because to have collaborative governance and have co-creation and so on, uh, one of the basic foundations or conditions is trust you know, and, and you must have uh, often a long tradition of cultivating trust uh, amongst different actors because if you don't trust each other you don't want to come together and collaborate and co-create to find new solutions and in in in, in some countries there there is this trust this basic trust and social capital that can be exploited to have other than top-down government solutions even in times of crisis thank you anybody else like I was going to say um, from a COVID-19 so just in respect of COVID-19 actually what uh, we have seen uh, from my point of view as a lawyer is that uh, all the good governance and better regulation principles have been mostly violated by national authorities in the urgency uh, you know raised by the COVID-19 situation in a lot of European countries for instance a lot of restrictions were adopted by national governments with that uh, legal basis uh, the proportionality principle has also quite regularly been violated. The principle of legal certainty, transparency also have been regularly violated. And this uh, continues to this day. Um, another interesting aspect of COVID-19 is the fact that uh, in a lot of countries, uh, police forces have been enforcing a soft law. Uh, in breach of the law, actually. Uh, in the UK, for instance, uh, they, most people are unable to distinguish what is prohibited by law 
uh, be, and what is prohibited uh, under soft law guidance adopted by the government. The government essentially deliberately making uh, sure that people don't know what is covered under strict uh, legal norms and uh, what is part of the soft guidance. So from, a, I would say, uh, COVID-19 has actually uh, seen possibly is not a, a good example of uh, better regulation slash good governance uh, principles being complied with. Now uh, you can be forgiving uh, at least, uh, let's say just for a couple of months, uh, but now we've been um, almost one year and some countries are still in a state of uh, medical or slash uh, uh, state of emergency. Um, so um, in a way, COVID-19 has been a silver line, I mean, has been a blessing in disguise uh, for uh, autocrats and would-be autocrats. So uh, I'm uh, being a bit more pessimistic than Jacob here, I'm afraid. Um, Kelly, if you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, just very quickly, and I won't, and I won't take the COVID view on this. I'll start at the beginning of the question, which is empirical tests to measure the value or outcomes of public governance. The work that I'm doing with the Swiss Development Corporation uh, in looking at how they fund and work um, in projects around the world, one of the key elements that we're looking at is an issue of public value and public value governance in each for each targeted investment. If we cannot show, or if the project or if the country cannot show what they're trying to achieve in terms of public value governance at outcome level, the project doesn't proceed. It's very clear. And they have, and they have set out um, four or five principles that they measure against public value governance. And if that can't be demonstrated, the investment isn't made. So while it might not be a quote unquote empirical test uh, you know, in, in the academic world, it certainly is a filter through which they're making um, their intervention decisions. And it's a really interesting process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mary, you have been trying to raise your hand. Um, feel free to connect um, to ask your question. Thank you, Adila. It's, it's actually a comment as well as a question. Um, one of my PhD students have just completed her study and she developed a strategic management framework for intra-governmental collaborations. Now, Kelly, you would be interested to know that she used crime as a wicked problem. Um, and then looked at how different departments within South Africa try and address crime because the collaboration was obviously not there because the wicked pro problem is growing and growing. And so, you know, we, we did it very much out of a strategic management perspective, but as all of you were talking about co-creation and value governance, I realized that there's a lot of synergies between public value and commercial value um, and strategic management. So I thought it was very enlightening um, and, and this is some feedback to her as well to consider the value governance perspective here. Um, and I really enjoyed the fact that you, you spoke about the wicked problem specifically, Kelly, because um, we thought we were quite novel in the idea of, of classifying crime as a wicked problem and then you know using quite an interesting technique uh, uh, interactive qualitative analysis to sort of find or develop this this framework um, but today's today's uh, webinar really just gave me so much additional insight um, it's such a pity we didn't have this three years ago that's great thank you thank you um, Professor Tofen, you have your hand raised, right? No, I just wanted to say that that I actually have a, an article in the Policy and Politics about crime as a wicked problem and co-creation of uh, innovative outcomes. And in this study, we, we study uh, close to 30 different local uh, crime prevention projects with multiple stakeholders in the city of Copenhagen. And we do a regression analysis um, of uh, where we are measuring both the, the, the degree of collaboration, the degree of innovation and the crime preventive effect. And we find that, that there's a clear uh, uh, connection and, and impact in the sense that the more collaboration, the more innovation, the more innovation, the more uh, uh, crime preventive uh, effect. So uh, yeah, you can, if, if anybody should be interested, you can find that article in, in policy and politics. Uh, specifically on, on crime as, as wicked problems and the role of co-creation in solving them. Thank Excellent. You. I'll, I'll definitely uh, find that article. It sounds really ex 
interesting. So um, just um, a question, of course, uh, everybody feel free to ask. Uh, Imam, did you have your hand raised? Exactly. I just want to take a question that has been asked in the chat. And I also want to adopt it a little bit. It was asked by Bruce Kibler, who had to lay for us for teaching. But he was saying that, um, I mean, kind of saying that public value governance is an interesting concept. Uh, nevertheless, does it kind of work in, a, in an environment that is so uh, polar as, for example, in the US? Um, doesn't it create even more problems in a way? And that goes also, I want to add that, so that's a question to you, Jacob, but I translated a bit also for you, Kelly, saying what could be then risks adopting a model such public value governance, particularly in an African context from, from your experiences? You were saying we have everybody sh shares the same goals, but in a, uh, achieving it, what could be also some challenges when, when just kind of just adopting such public value, value uh, governance model? I could have a go at the first question about polarization because you know, well, you might be right that polarization might create you know create a problem for co-creation, but I don't think so because in uh, in co-creation you don't start with goals. If you started with goals and you were very polarized, you would not be able to have a simple conversation. You will not be able to co-create. But in co-creation, you start with a problem and you start with a problem that affects multiple stakeholders and multiple people in a local environment, you know, that, that we live in a city with, uh, you know, lack of good food, food shops or lack of green spaces or lack of playgrounds and so on. And regardless of your political orientation, you may, you may experience such a, a problem and you will be able often to come together uh, regardless of your political uh, views and perspectives and deal with that problem. So I think the problem focused approach uh, of co-creation is helpful to bring actors together. And when we are first brought together and we realize that we all parents looking for the nearby playground and we cannot find it, right? Uh, we, 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 are, we are prepared to open up and, and discuss. And, and then we start to see that the other, other, you know, other people are not enemies, but actually uh, 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 friends that we did meet before now. So, so I, I, I'm pretty optimistic that we can have, actually see co-creation as a, as a tool for building trust amongst people and also a tool for connecting um, uh, uh, political elites and the people, because that is what authoritarian populism is thriving on. That is the disconnection between uh, elected leaders and, and the population. And co-creation is, I think, a tool for bringing more people into uh, public decision-making processes and therefore reducing that gap that now feeds uh, authoritarian populism like Trump and, and many uh, other countries. Yeah. Um. Okay. So for, to answer your question, what might be some of the challenges in, in transposing or adopting public value governance in Africa? Um, I would give two comments based on my experience working in Mauritius and in, uh, and in Namibia. And I think it's right, <clears throat> rising above the sense of community. And I'll define what I mean by community and about power and control. So somehow we have to build a business case uh, and it's a courageous business case to have leaders understand that public value governance is, is a way of keeping them relevant with their stakeholders, with their voters, essentially. Um, and that's a tough sell because right now we need to rise above the, the concept of what's the easiest thing for us to do, which isn't necessarily public value governance. So where's the path of least resistance on how we take our decisions? The second thing is around, um, I'm going to lose power if I co-create, if I share, if I collaborate, I'm not that ultimate decision maker anymore. Therefore my standing in the community is somehow uh, diminished and that's not acceptable to me from an ego point of view. So pe people don't understand that they can work their social capital in a different way 
to continue to be the person that brings the amazing solution and solves the problem and is very popular and that translates to votes. And thirdly, it's rising above the sense of community. Now, I'm going to use a different uh, definition for the word community than we have been using so far this morning. And I use this word community when I, when I was working with government in Mauritius to create a public sector business transformation strategy. And we talk about the different communities in Mauritius. Mauritius is a rainbow country. We have different communities and we have different voices. And sometimes we need to rise above uh, what we might normally want to do for our community at the expense of another one. There's a wonderful situation I found myself in at a Commonwealth conference in Arusha uh, some years ago, and I was on a panel with the Minister of Government Services and Public Services from Kenya. And we were talking about meritocracy and bringing people into the public service in a way where uh, the skills we needed were what the skills that people brought. And he said to me, Kelly, I can't work like that. Because if someone from my community comes to me and tells me I have to eat, I will give him a job and I don't care if he's qualified or not qualified. That sense of community and that sense of tying back to where are my votes coming from presents a challenge in adopting public value governance in its purest sense anywhere in the world. You have those, you have, I can give you examples here in Canada where we have some of those challenges. So for me, it's about power, control, and how we define community when we want to co-create. And it's rising above all of that chatter, all of that noise to look at the world and say, what's the right thing to do? Not what's the easy thing to do. Not everybody's brave enough to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And um, apologies if I've missed anybody who raised their hand earlier and feel free to ask your question. Um, for me, I really enjoyed the three presentations and I think they really do, um, they are linked uh, in the way that I, as a collaborator in the centre, uh, want to see the, uh, ex want to explore the concept of public value governance. Namely, when Professor Laurent Pesch, when he, he, he talked about, you know, it's all uh, lately a rebranding exercise. For example, uh, smart regulation, better regulation, all of these words and phrases that we have been hearing so far, co-creation um, and uh, involvement, participation of civil society and working closely, collaborating and networking and so on. They are really uh, the words that we are, um, we wish applies everywhere. Uh, and of course, in practice, um, to what extent it's, um, it's done, that is something that we want to explore in the center as well. And um, in it's the idea, the one thing as well that uh, was mentioned, for example, in the EU, transparency is a legal principle that began to appear in the last 20 years, if, if I understood that well, uh, in legal documents. So uh, it seems quite recent, 20 years. Why not from the beginning itself and so on? So likewise, all these concepts and all these ideas that are really positive uh, and uh, will have positive implications if they apply would be great. But then when we look at indicators as highlighted in one of the questions uh, in governance and so on, not just overall governance, but when we break down uh, sub indicators and so on. So the, the extent of how, um, to, to what degree it's done and um, how as well, um, I'm interested in exploring how public authorities or government actors respond to, to, um, to you know, to the, the fact that they can improve their public value governance and so on by being co-creative and so on, being involved in co-creation. So how do they take that on board and to what extent do they practice it? For example, participation of civil society first mentioned in a recent, quite recent document. So they are, they are responding to, to, the, to the demand or the issues at hand. Uh, but now, why was it there from the beginning and how are they being um, constant and um, 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 apply, putting it into practice? This is something that I'm uh, interested in exploring in the center. It's not a question per se, but rather it was a, a comment uh, and perhaps I'm just thinking out loud uh, as my collaborators know that I do. <laughs> Apologies for that. And. Uh, Oh yeah, we have a comment here on the chat box. Thank you to the free speakers and other participants. Uh, uh, the participants, 
Costa, who would like to raise a question, unless no, you, just, yeah. Feel free, yeah. you so. Thank, thank you very much, thank you very much, Amy. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I have uh, some general wanderings or um, a more global global question, which might it's may, maybe also a bit naive, but uh, I guess that's uh, because of my background. Um, uh, I do research in, in the field of health services research, uh, so I'm, I'm not a specialist. Uh, uh, but uh, you, you have been talking about regulation, about wicked problems and compl complex problems. So. Um, I've been thinking about these issues recently, and I've came to the conclusion that uh, global problems should be addressed and dealt uh, at the global level. So I was wondering, do you agree with this consideration? And if yes, what is the role, what should be the role of the United Nations, for example? Uh, is this uh, an apt uh, organization to, to, to address these problems uh, because I'm, I'm not completely sure because of the way it is constructed, right? You have this council and if one single uh, state is a different opinion, then it can block a certain uh, measures, operations. So uh, is it, would you uh, agree or what do you think is it, uh, would you say, would you go so far to say that the United Nations organization is experiencing uh, a, a brain brain death to use the words of a uh, 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 French president I, I think it was Macron and uh, or would you say that okay it's not a problem we don't need the United Nations uh, what it takes is something like a coalition of the willing to use the words of another president that uh, 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 yeah uh, yeah anyway so uh, what do you think about that Thank you, Costa. Um, any speaker would like to uh, take on the comment on the involvement of the e UN? I mean, uh, uh, I can uh, give it a go, but Adila, this is really a UK cup of tea rather than mine. Uh, no, but essentially, uh, um, all the global uh, problems uh, tend to deserve uh, global answers to be the most effective. In fact, uh, this is in a way also what the EU uh, was created to address uh, common problems together in the name of a more effective answers. Uh, so you can have a global answer. It doesn't mean that it does exclude uh, regional or national complementary answers. Now, uh, the UN is just one of many uh, international organizations uh, fulfilling a, a specific mandate. Uh, so I, th I think essentially um, I I'm not going to try to justify the existence of the UN, but I would say that if you have a global problem, then it would make sense to have a global answer. Uh, to have an effective global answer, you need an institutional frameworks. This is why we have the UN. This is why we have the World Bank. This is why we have NATO. But each of these organizations has been created to address a specific goal. Uh, that being said, uh, just to conclude, uh, think about climate change. Uh, don't you think that a global answer is the only way to address uh, climate change, which is essentially uh, a threat for everyone? Same, I would say, for COVID-19. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Uh, so essentially, we still need uh, collective answers to collective problems. The most difficult aspect is to devise the best institutional frameworks to actually come up with uh, the most effective solutions. But this is not a new problem. And uh, before globalization, you had also plenty of attempts uh, to address collective issues. Uh, think about international maritime law, for instance. Uh, so we've been uh, having uh, you know, international answers to international issues for, for a long time. So that would be my attempt at answering uh, your question about the UN. And my attempt at answering the question is very similar, Laurent, to your, to your approach. We have global frameworks in place, and there are a number of different organizations that have a remit or a mandate to be involved in coming up with global solutions to global challenges. The UN is only one body. It's not the overarching supreme body. It's one body. We have a whole bunch of them. The thing that matters to me is implementation. So whatever decisions are taken globally in whatever fora to solve whatever issue, it's the 
it's the willingness and courage at national level to implement that decision, but also implement it within your own context. Because I think too often, one of the pushbacks with the UN is, okay, you've come up with a solution, the box looks like this, and when I try to take that box and apply it in my own country, I've got all of these other variables that you didn't think about. And so because you didn't think about them, it opens the door for me not to do anything. So it's around that implementation and implementing in the flavor, the color, the context of what your local environment is saying. But there is an extreme relevance for global institutions or coalitions of the willing, however you want to frame it, um, to address these global problems. Because, um, and I think that's one of the beauties of the sustainable development goals. So that's my attempt at answering. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, both answers, um, I believe, give you some food for, give us some food for thought, Costa. Uh, thank you for the question. And thank you very on much. The, um, in the comment section, we have uh, a participant who said thank you to the three speakers and the other participants. Uh, the participant is mainly in marketing and sales, however, has been uh, introduced um, to the SDG concept recently. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, the participant says, I must admit that this is getting more and more intriguing on how all these concepts like PVG, SDGs, wicked problems and solution, community, co-creation come together. And the synergy of these uh, concepts, they can count what they can create when merged in the best possible way in different countries around the world. And the participant looks forward to more such webinars. We as well do uh, look forward to further discussing the, these topics. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Um, we have uh, a few more minutes, uh, um, I guess. I will take the chance. Um, it's a question to both of you, Kelly and Laurent, uh, but from also again, a, a little bit different perspectives. You, Laurent, you study a lot of the EU context. From that perspective, what would you say could, I frame these te terms, uh, I know that they're, they're really critical, but I use it now. What could kind of the global South learn from the EU, but mainly from what hasn't been done. So don't make the same errors. And Kelly, from your experience, what would you say could kind of the global north also learn from from the culture from from the global south uh, from African countries in order kind of to to improve public value governance? So, thank you. That's a, an interesting uh, question. I don't think I've ever been asked this question, so I was uh, thinking about uh, the question. Um, and I'm afraid uh, I will need to reflect on this uh, good question. Uh, from my point of view, I would say what I have seen is essentially the EU possibly trying to reinvent the wheel every three or four years, just using a different uh, wording of what is essentially the same concept. I mean, the essential question the EU has been trying to address is how to be a more effective regulator. So does that mean uh, we should stop using old fashioned legal instruments and complement them with non-legal instruments? And I think that's a fair enough for questioning. Um, that being said, I think there is also a lot of kind of um, just doing it for the sake of it because it's trendy and fashionable. Um, so essentially, uh, uh, I was criticizing at the end of my presentation this uh, excessive focus, in my view, on just purely uh, quantitative issues. So if you have fewer regulation, then it must mean that this is good. So I think uh, possibly that's the lesson I would uh, suggest people learn from the EU, that you should have a bit more sophisticated approach to better regulation. Nothing can be solved uh, quickly in the short term. This is a long term exercise. You need resources. If you're going to create a better regulation unit in a government or in a state structure, you better give them the resources to do this. And this is as this is also a cultural shift. So you're not going to change uh, uh, the situation just by changing the rules or just giving more resources to better regulation units, you need also to embed a, a new set of values in, uh, in the structure you are leading. So this is essentially a long term exercise, I would say, which must not be guided by the latest uh, trend, uh, you know, you need to have a long term view. 
And I would say, if anything, COVID-19 has taught us is that uh, possibly fewer regulation is not a better regulation. What we need is possibly smart regulation to use the latest uh, term in the EU regulation world. So I'm actually uh, a big fan of regulation myself. I don't think less means uh, better. Uh, in my experience as a lawyer, when you have a fewer rules, uh, usually what happens is essentially then you have the rule of the jungle. So essentially the biggest, uh, most powerful players end up uh, uh, designing uh, the framework uh, within which we must behave. So I would say a regulation laws are good if you want to implement an egalitarian uh, system of governance. So thank you for the good question, but I will need to come back uh, next year to give you my full uh, detailed, uh, thoughtful answer to this uh, thoughtful question. Thank you. So my, my answer to your question around what could the global north learn from the global south, um, I, I'm really glad that you asked that question because this is a sort of a personal passion that I have. Um, I and I'll give you a story and then I'll give you an example. So the story that I'd like to share is in 2011, I was at a, a conference in Arusha, Tanzania and Kenya brought forward its M-Pesa program, which is the, the connecting citizens through mobile phones to remit payments, um, vote, have job interviews. It was a really innovative system because um, Kenya couldn't afford the infrastructure to have uh, landlines across the country, but they certainly could afford the infrastructure to have mobile phones. So they said, why would we start where the rest of the world started on how we connect people? Let's leapfrog and go right into mobile phones. And on those mobile phones, we're going to do things like have bank transfers. So you don't have to go to Wells Fargo or those kinds of organizations and we can connect the country. And they presented this at a conference. And they, they asked the UK, Australia and Canada, would you be interested in looking at what we're doing and piloting in, in your countries? And I was there at the session, I was speaking and the response from the three developed countries was no, we have nothing to learn from you. So my point in giving this story is that we have to be willing and open to listen and willing and open to learn. And I see the power actually more in South-South cooperation than in North-South cooperation. And, and, and I believe in it so much that I've taken in, in personally a leap of faith in, uh, in coming together with a collaborator in Australia to start a consultancy linking Australian and African innovations. And secondly, I created an innovation foundation in the Netherlands last year, which explores the role innovation plays in shaping strategic resilient decisions, particularly in Africa, and how those solutions can be adopted and adopted um, around the world. So I believe the potential for really creative solutions lives in the African continent. And I think we need to be willing to listen and learn a little better than we have been in the past. So thanks for the question. Thank you uh, uh, for the question. Uh, Imam Din has been asking that question um, very regularly at our uh, weekly meeting. So I'm happy he asked it. And uh, I'm happy that Professor Laurent Pesch uh, needs to reflect further on <laughs> the question. And um, one final com question from uh, we perhaps may take from the participant uh, in the chat box asking, um, are we suggesting that public value governance strategies may have to vary by political, cultural, social context? Uh, perhaps this has been addressed uh, already. And if yes, do we need more contingent, contingency based theories of public value governance or good governance? Um, so um, uh, going to the first part of the question, I believe Professor Tolfing mentioned that it depends on country context, uh, it depends on uh, different factors, so perhaps yes, uh, public value governance strategies, uh, if we can take it from the speakers, they do uh, need to be adjusted to uh, local context and they need to be thought about in terms of local implementation and so on. And uh, in regards to whether we need more contingency based theories, I think Imam Din is going to um, uh, appreciate this question because one of our centers um, 
purpose is to explore uh, the potential of uh, coming up with um, theories and uh, on the subject of uh, public value governance. So yes, perhaps uh, this is something we will be exploring and the answer to your question is yes. Anybody else would like to address this final question? Feel free to do so. Yeah, I, I just would want to add also, uh, I see it rather than a question much more as an input. I think that's a really interesting approach, uh, especially to look at contingency faith theories. Um, I think that goes quite at the core of, of actually, as, as Adila said, where we want to go with our research, with our future research. And um, uh, that, that's a really good point to take, definitely. Yep. So um, I think we have come to the end of uh, today's presentation. We can't thank you enough. And one perhaps uh, <laughs> um, consolation uh, point is that you are all part of CAST's history. You have attended the inaugural webinar and your part of the history. Really appreciate everybody's contribution. We can't thank the speakers enough and uh, all the participants and all the questions we've had and the, the interaction. We have learned from you and this is a conversation that we intend to continue uh, within our center. Please, uh, um, we will share further details about further webinars with you. And uh, actually, that's one of the final slides. Um, uh, allow me to share it with you. For... I, I have it already. So oh, it already. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, here are the presenters for our next webinar. Um, as say, the topic will be about um, kind of defining in further detail what do we understand, what do, you, do we have to understand from the African context, what we can learn from it, etc. So we're going to have uh, Professor Joel Botteille from Concordia University, again, somebody from Canada, uh, who did quite interesting research also in, in South Africa, and at the same time uh, started a discussion about saying we should actually look much closer to those cases because it could help us in a way to, to enrich theory, theory de development in organization studies and so on. Um, because a lot of theory at the moment is usually based on, on, on Western cases. So uh, we should break out from kind of this one-sided perspective. Uh, Adila, maybe you introduced uh, quickly the other second two presenters. Yeah, so uh, Camila Oroca, she is the head of uh, research at the Ibrahim, at the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. She works on the Ibrahim Index of African Governance, and uh, she will be talking, she will be sharing some of the data on African governance, which I think will be uh, fruitful to our ongoing conversation. And finally, we have Dr. Fouachade Sule Konhu, and she works a lot on actually um, um, global South relations, including China's involvement, uh, India's involvement in Africa. And she also has uh, a lot of insights on the context of agency in Africa, which we uh, look forward to hearing from uh, in July. The date will be confirmed in due course. Uh, most likely, it's going to be uh, 21st of July. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that's the end, unless there's still any some final questions or comments. Otherwise, also from my side, thank you very much for your participation, for your presentations, uh, input, comments, and so on. Thank you. Until the next event, where all our speakers, of course, remain invited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.